Now, a sports writer once theorised that if Australian football is a religion, then my next guest is its high priest. Then he really had a rush of blood to the head when he said he was to Australian football what Nureyev was to the dance. Well, meanwhile, back on the planet Earth, it is for sure that he's one of the biggest names to emerge in the 120 years of Australian rules. He was a great player, and without exception, the most successful coach of recent years. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ron Barassi. <laughs> Ron, one of the things, that, remarkable things about you which interested me is that you've extended this motivation of football teams into the business world now. What's the, you go along and talk to people in companies and motivate their sales force and this sort of thing. What's the strangest request that you've ever had for your services as a motivator? <laughs> well, it happened recently. Uh, I was in Perth for a uh, football match with our team and uh, a gentleman in a little place called Mullawa, which is about 70 miles east of Geraldton in WA uh, organised me to give a talk to the town of two or three hundred people and uh, to celebrate his dealership of uh, 14 years of age. It was an anniversary type thing, he thought he'd do something for the town to celebrate and uh, that was okay, we were all organised and uh, on the way up uh, from Perth to Mullawa via light plane I, I asked uh, one of the gentlemen who was with me, uh, what does Bob want me to talk on? And uh, he said, well he got your brochure and one of your talks is entitled uh, How to Recover from a Slump, a Down, a Rut. And I said, uh, well, that's good, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll do that, it'll be okay. Um, what are they recovering from? Why are they in a slump, this town? And he said, oh, they haven't had rain for four years. <laughs> I said, y you mean you want me to... <laughs> be a rainmaker. I said, that's, you know, that's just not on. It's, it's impossible to help people out of that situation unless uh, you know, it starts raining. So I persuaded him to... Uh, to accept my normal presentation of on general motivation, which is which is what I did, and uh, it was quite an experience in front of the whole town, uh, assembled in front of the uh, local football club uh, grandstand with kids and cows and dogs and <laughs> all sorts of things behind me. It was an unusual experience. But the key question is, did it rain? Well, it did rain actually, <laughs> <laughs> but it took just, about a month. <laughs> I just wanted to establish your omnipotence. That's all. <laughs> what is in fact the secret of motivating people? I think it's, uh, oh, it's a very wide subject. Uh, it's probably touching upon something that uh, acts on something they feel. I mean, you can't, uh, motivation is a motive to act. And if you have no motive, you've got no wants and desires, well, you can't be potted into acting in any direction. You're just a vegetable if you've got none at all. Most people have, luckily. Uh, I suppose it's just a matter of uh, getting them to, uh, to think a bit more deeply about those things and perhaps guiding them or explaining uh, there are certain principles after that. Mm. That's Would the basis of it. Would you work my new religion on donuts? Would you help us <laughs> get, uh, get that going? Well, you can be the cheap donut. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, very fattening. Yeah. Yeah. But what about, what about um, when you're motivating a football team? I mean, let's, let's specify now. Let's make it narrow it down. I mean, how much does fear play? Fear of you from the players uh, playing that? Well, uh, there are all sorts of motivation things, I suppose. Fear is one. Uh, challenge is, is another. Uh, pride is one. Love is one. Uh, uh, a good coach, uh, the same as a good manager of, of people, uh, uses them all. Uh, a coach may use a little bit more fear than perhaps the manager out in, uh, in industry because out, out in the industry, uh, the guy can say, look, I've had enough of that rubbish and just walk out. Yes, Whereas right. The guys at the football club are a little bit more captive. We lock the doors and all sorts of things like that. They can't get away. Uh, <laughs> so, so we do use fear to a certain degree, but uh, that by itself would would never be enough. But do you ever push a player, have you ever pushed a player to breaking point? Uh, well, no one's ever swung a punch at me. Haven't they? I feel like it. Have they cried in front of you? Uh, not in the football sense, no. Uh, might be discussing a personal problem, that's, that's happened. Uh, I may well have cried with them if it's been a big enough personal thing. Uh, under their breath, they're probably saying all sorts of things. That's one of the great things about uh, a team sport, that there has to be a certain discipline. Uh, you really can't argue with a coach uh, during training or during a match purely for a, a practical reason that there isn't time to, to certainly have one out, one out. Uh, afterwards, yes, there's plenty of time. We'll talk for hours. Mm. 
but at the time uh, they've really just got to cop it. And, and I think that's good in one sense that uh, it does make them grab a bit of self-control for themselves and that basically is what you're trying to teach them. Uh, uh, motivation really out in the field must become self-motivation. Uh, discipline out in the field must become self-discipline. That, that's the, the crux of the, that's the aim of the whole thing. You said that no player's ever taken a swing at you when you've been a, a, a coach, but you had the reputation of being a, a tough player in your playing years. Did you ever have a punch up on the field then? Oh, never, never, Oh, never. come on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> no, uh, I did, I, I, I played for about 16 years, and I, I guess I swung about uh, seven or eight punches. Which is the best when you landed? <laughs> well, there's, there, there was one incident which I wasn't very proud of because uh, it was from behind, you know, that's uh, in the classics as class as a king hit. Uh, and uh, it happened this way, that this particular player had done something which I you know, took exception to, and after I recovered, uh, I saw him in the distance, uh, and I just took off. And the fact that he was facing the other way was just uh, coincidental. If he'd been facing me, it would have been even better. Uh, but that was, uh, it wasn't something which I admired about myself. In fact, I felt very, very guilty about it. Do you think for, uh, well, any sport it brings out the best or the worst in people, Philip? Well, I'd like to answer that another way, if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm a part-time archaeologist, and I discovered that Melbourne was established by a group like the Aztecs, known as the Anzacs. <laughs> and they, they built a great... Please, I listen to you. They built a great pyramid called the Shrine of Remembrance. And Yarra is based on the chant, Yay Ra, who was, of course, the god. <laughs> now, he is, in fact, the high priest of an ancient fertility rite. Uh, football, consider it for a minute. First of all, you have the large egg shape, right? The fellows rush out and sort of rupture a condom as they rush onto the field. <laughs> they all then fight for this egg. This little sort of uh, spermatozoa, I suppose it is. <laughs> and they charge around everywhere trying to impregnate these symbolic legs <laughs> at each end of the field. That's not generally known. No, it's not generally known, but what I want to know is what part does the coach play in this fantasy? <laughs> it orchestrates the whole thing. Yes, is it, is I the gynaecologist in it, bro? In a sense, in a sense. Now, actually, uh, uh, Philip is a, a bit of a knocker of football, but he, he does it in such a way that you know, we... Don't you hit me, bro. We, <laughs> we can't help but love him, but uh, really... Uh, this is, and I'm not taking exception to what uh, Philip said at all, because it's, it's said in a ter tremendous spirit, but there is a, as a great <laughs> knocking syndrome in, this, in Australia <laughs> <laughs> that uh, is very annoying. And, and when you think about it, you can knock any single thing at all. Uh, let's take, say, say, a game of chess. If you know nothing about it and you, you, your knocking comes out, have a look at those two guys. I've watched them for half an hour and I haven't moved. What a ridiculous game, but just as easily just as easy you can say, hmm, I know nothing about chess, but those guys, they're so involved. Oh, gosh, I must learn that game. Mm. You know, it's, it's just as easy. Yeah, I think that, uh, I think what, what Philip was sort of saying there... I know what he was trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, making a, look, I'm making a very serious point. Football is one of the great Australian rituals. It does have religious significance. In Melbourne, it is, it's much bigger than Catholicism. And uh, I know nothing about it. We play I've on been, Saturdays, not Sundays. Mate, I've, been to foot, I've been to football matches and felt the hair rising. It, it, it's like watching Christians being eaten by lions, which I would have enjoyed equally, I'm sure. <laughs> it's exhilarating and it's, it's, it's that great cheer that comes on the football ground. I, at a distance, it sounds like a yawn of boredom, but close up, <laughs> it's terrific. But I mean, what, what part does it play? And what part do, do people like, uh, like Rom play, the folk heroes in the, in the public uh, relations? In, an, in a country with very few heroes and leader images, Rom certainly provides one. There's mm. no question of that. Mm. And also, something that must be said about him, Barassi, a Greek name, I suspect. Is Italian. It? Italian, OK. Me. Sorry. Swiss now, Italian, actually. Victoria <laughs> is not a state where there's much love of the migrant. I can, I've conducted a survey which was shattering. 19% of Victorians were positively for multiculturalism. 50% were off Garnet bigots, the rest fopped around like old fish. <laughs> and, uh, but one thing that football does, if you look at the list of players in the football teams, it really is the most astonishingly successful multicultural activity. The it names of the players are from every country. That's true. Uh, well, it's something to be expected because they've been here for quite a while. My great-grandfather, Carlo Giuseppe, came out in 1854. But football has another use uh, in society. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a lever. It means that the managing director can go to work on a, on a Monday and he can talk to the office boy uh, about something of interest in both, you know, and he pays him the, his 20 cents that the bet was laid and all that sort of thing. I think that's, it's got to be a good thing if it brings people together. 
with a common interest. Uh, it mightn't be a deep interest, but a common interest, it's, it's got to be a good thing. Mm. But what about the, I think well, the point a lot of people might make about sport nowadays, not just Australian rules, uh, generally speaking through sport, is that under the label of this awful word professionalism, that what's happened is that, that, that sport's become too important. Too important to the players, too important to the managers, the coaches, and certainly too important to the, to the spectators. That it's, it's become, I mean, after all, if you look at any game, basically, Ron, it's only a game. It was created, in spite of Philip's fantasies, it was created as a means of enjoyment and physical pursuit. Today, it's not, not that at all. I mean, people cheat, well, lie, kill, anything well, for it. That might apply to your uh, cricket and uh, football. Like it's sectarian. You <laughs> see? It's sectarian. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I, I agree, the, the excesses of any pursuit are generally pretty boring or horrific. Uh, and uh, it behoves all of us involved in it and, and perhaps people on the fringe of any uh, society happening, like uh, uh, a fiercely uh, competitive sport, to remind us all that we've just got to keep uh, our feet on the ground to a certain degree. But it becomes a bit more than just a game when you start putting a lot more into it. When you, once, once that happens, and uh, that's professionalism, you're putting your whole being into it, your, your thoughts and your mind, your body, hours of training, hours of effort and so forth, uh, it isn't just a game that you really enjoy whilst it's happening. It's, it's like a, any any uh, any involving listen, hobby. Listen afterwards, to this bloke. he's got he's a, the most religious man on earth yeah, for yeah. cricket. Now you know about the religious origins of cricket, oh, don't oh you? God, please tell me. <laughs> right. Please tell me. <laughs> Which is the phallic so, It was played. Listen, this is lost. So long as this fantasy includes reference to my native county, I might well, buy it. It came, right? it came from a, a forgotten monastery in Yorkshire. Oh, thank you. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> The, th the three stumps represent the Holy Trinity. Oh my God. And there are the eleven blokes plus one, that's the eleven apostles plus one who was in a bit of trouble. And uh, they wear white, don't they? Which is symbolic yeah. of purity. And they throw the red satanic demonic ball and try and disrupt the Holy Trinity. The, uh, it's a religion. I just leave them be. I mean, I mean, I mean, <laughs> Here, eh? A load of old nonsense, that one. Eh? <laughs> I guess if you asked Philip, you know, how, how to put the same connotations on an advertising agency, he would come up with something oh, just like that. Oh, it's a very pagan cult, that one. I <laughs> <laughs> That's the worship of mammon. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> what about the, the point I was going to, though? I mean, you see it nowadays, don't you, in the sort of uh, Olympic game, that sort of laughable ritual we all go through in the name of sort of uh, amateur sport. We all know that, you know, uh, those amateurs are all professionals. I mean, what I'm getting at is, is that we seem to have lost sight of the, of the real purpose in sport. I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I think at the top level, you may be right, but uh, the top level of the sport is only probably 5% of it. Right. As long as the other 95% are having a good time and enjoying the thrill and the challenge and uh, run around and, and enjoying it. And as long as they've got the feet on the ground, I don't think it matters that much what the other 5% do. Mm. I know they lead the 95% to a certain degree, but... Uh, most uh, kids uh, who are playing football and cricket, they, they just love it. There's but nothing wrong with that. I remember Joe Mercer, who was a very wise old man in, in England, and a, a very good manager in his day, said to me that, summing all this up one day, said that you know, the trouble is in sport nowadays, across the board, you never see anybody smile on a field of play anymore. And I think that's right at the nub of it, you see. Now, mm. well, well, I agree, it doesn't happen, but you haven't got time. Well, there you are, <laughs> no, no, because you're not really enjoying it. That's the point. No, no, right, if you're not enjoying it at the time, because of the greater, uh, greater amount you put into it, you enjoy it a lot more afterwards. Mm. Ron, have you heard of the, the so-called new games? And this isn't a joke, this is a serious point. New games? The new games. We, brought them, out, we brought them out from the States. The concept was not to have games in which you don't want to win. We'd, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> we'd, we, we'd get three or 4,000 people of all ages playing together. Lot of fun, but it was participation in the fun of it. There was no victory intended. You get 2,000 people on a tug of one of those ropes, in a tug of war ropes. We had a thing called the whole earth ball, a great globe, which, you know, with continents drawn on it, and people just tossed around like a huge volleyball. Everyone had a lot of fun. That's recreation, but, that's but not But the sport. ideology of it was enjoy yourself and don't care about winning and losing, because that's the problem. For every winner, there are a lot of losers. Mm. And it's like any sort of, it's like the awards at the Australian Film Institute. A film wins, it's pretty artificial. Everyone else loses. Mm. I find prizes, winning, is a bit artificial. Mm. Yes, I, I think uh, you know, this winning and losing bit has dangers, and the dangers are that the loser feels a failure. But the point is, if we had, as an ideal above winning, uh, that each person or each group of people do their very best, win or lose, 
you can look anybody in, in the eye, and there's no chance you'll feel a failure if you've, you know, you've got it together inside. You, no one can do any more than their very best, and, and that's a coach's job to, to get the very best out of his team and for each member of the team to do his very best, and usually you'll win anyway, but if you don't, well, what does it matter? I mean, uh, the state of the world is not altered one whit by uh, England beating Australia in a test match or... Don't you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, everybody goes around their, uh, their, about their job and their life and their career next day as though nothing has happened. And that's why it's ludicrous to think that under, under 12 coaches of a football team uh, carry on and say the whole world depends upon it. You know, it's just stupid. Gee, when I was a kid in Clifton Hill, the Collingwood loss, there was the whole placement of the morning for a fortnight. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Of course, I mean, one of the other things, too, that happens in, in, the, in this increasingly professional attitude towards sport is that is all kinds of things are induced into sport to, to make the players perform better. Drugs, for instance, which, I mean, are, are prevalent now, particularly in, in, in athletics. Is there any uh, evidence at all of, of uh, use of drugs in, in Australian rules? Well, the last, or, last uh, drug I saw being used in football was uh, a nip of whiskey at three-quarter time. Uh, a player that I used to play with used to like that, uh, and he played a lot better afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as you know, the drugs that you're talking about, I really don't know of any cases in Australian football. I've never heard of it in any, any uh, cricket or football and other codes. Uh, I'd be definitely against it because if we continue on with that, it means that the, the team or the club or the nation with the best sporting scientist wins. I mean, just, just against the whole thing. So you don't have a, a team chemist? Now we have a team of uh, psychotherapists and right. hypnotists and all those sort of things. <laughs> but, but, but you know now that what's happening in, 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 in athletics, I mean, you do yes, obviously... But I know, I know, I know that, and I think it's entirely wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I was told by an athlete, actually, that he went to America recently and ran a 100-yard race there, and two of his opponents took coke before the race. Mm. And, you see, the problem is now is that they're not even... They're, I mean, they're not testing for that. The drugs, in fact, they're testing for, the athletes were using 10 years ago. I mean, I mean that, and that seems to me to be the, the, the appalling aspect of, of sport, which is really what I was trying to sort of... Well, it's like the, the, the suspicious the uh, Russian shop putters, you know, who yes, were, three years ago were men cutting forest down in Siberia, who are, have now got quite pert breasts. And that's right, yes. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's used of anabolic steroids. I think it's up to the administrators to be a lot stronger and to influence the coaches. And, and seeing the administrators uh, appoint coaches, they can, they've, they've got the power of the athlete through that. And, and it's up to them, really. Now, just dig in finally, this, this motivation uh, factor of yours. Um, and as I say, you apply it now to business. Um, could you think, uh, conceive a time when you might uh, apply it to the trade union movement in this country? <laughs> and if you did, what would you do? Well, uh, I'd love to have a chat to them. You would? I would, really would. Uh, I mightn't survive, mind you. <laughs> but I, I do think, I agree with, I heard Philip before and uh, woke up in time for he, to hear him say, uh, <laughs> no, only, you uh, don't hit me, don't hit me. <laughs> Uh, to say that the left wing, uh, which is the militant uni unionist in general, he's uh, left wing, uh, he's uh, supplanted his idealism and love, which Philip spoke of, with hate. And I think that's to be fought. I really, I really it's do. It's also to be fought at the corporate level, though, isn't it? Oh, yes. Oh, it's not just one sided. There's no question of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's very hard to, to, to speak and reason with and uh, guide or push or do anything with people who have hate in their heart. And do any of your plans in the future, Ron, um, exclude football and include a uh, career in politics? Uh, well, I've, I've been asked occasionally, uh, hints dropped and all those sort of things, but perhaps in, in the final analysis, uh, uh, maybe too selfish. Uh, in that, I just don't know whether I'd survive there. Uh, I don't know about the party system because a lot of my beliefs are in Labor. A lot of my beliefs are, are liberal, and uh, I'd have a hell of a... I'd you know, be in big trouble all the time. I reckon I'd make three headlines I'd last three years. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what would worry me. I'm very interested in it, and I think anybody who cares about Australia uh, must therefore be interested in, in politics, because politics is, is the organising of the system under which we live, the method by which we live, and it's got to include us. That's why it's ridiculous for these people who say sport, uh, sport is more important in politics in connection with Olympic Games. Uh, uh, politics is above everything because it is a system, it is society. It's the way we uh, try and uh, organise our lives and, and work together with our neighbours or whatever. So definitely it's more important. But as to whether I'd go into it, uh, I may have lived it too late from the point of view of, of age. You know, I'm 44 and... Uh, You're old, a bit too young for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I think a, a politician 
uh, should really give it everything he's got. He doesn't have any other interest but that, and uh, you know he's plenty of drive and energy. And politicians give it everything we have got. That's the thing. That <laughs> 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 Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.